Hello, everyone. Um, it's nice to, to see you all again, or more aptly to see your names again. I think most people have their cameras off right now with the exception of myself and Kim, which is okay. Um, today is part two of Ethics, Technology, and the Future of Medicine. Um, for anyone who's here today who wasn't here in the previous talk, uh, my name is Michael Van Manen. Uh, I'm a neonatologist, so my clinical practice is as a physician taking care of babies. Best job in the world, no offense to pathologists out there. Um, but it's lovely being involved in the care of babies born preterm, uh, ones who have complications around the time of birth, uh, or those who are born with different kinds of congenital problems. And ethics is very much at home in our discipline as we're constantly confronted with ethical issues. And then I am also the director of the Dossiter Health Ethics Center. And I put the link up here just as a reminder that you are always invited to attend any of our offerings should you be interested. Uh, most of our offerings are on Thursdays at lunch, although we sometimes do do evening events as well as weekend workshops. These were my take home points from last week. Um, I was trying to show uh, that ethics is always present in our day-to-day -day interactions. I was trying to convince you uh, that an ethical question that we need to start with is what is going on to which I must now respond. I talked a little bit about moral consciousness as well as different moral perspectives that can be used as heuristics to look at the so-called rightness or wrongness uh, of different approaches to particular situations. And then I also tried to show that ethics is not so much about arguing a position, but rather looking at a situation from different perspectives. And if the one thing that you can gain from this session as well as last session is to begin to look at different situations from a different perspective, then I'm hoping you'll found that these sessions are of value. So this week, I wanted to focus very much on technologies. And the take home points that I have for today are listed here. You'll hopefully appreciate their modifications of the take home points from the last week. And we'll take each one in turn. To help get us started, I want you to reflect. What role do technologies have in our lives? How do we evaluate technologies? In other words, what makes a good technology? or a bad technologies? What properties must a technology have if it is to be the object of moral concern? Meaning, at what point do we start to have obligations to technologies in and of themselves, whereby they somehow demand some form of respect? What kind of technological world do we want to live in? Do machines have the capacity for moral consciousness? What kind of humans do we want to become? Particularly if we take the stance that we have been or always will be in some way constructed by technologies. Last um, week at the end of our session together, um, we began talking about xenotransplantation. And clearly what stirred the discussion um, was the transplantation that occurred in the beginning of January, where David Bennett Sr. Um, received a genetically modified heart from a pig. And this was at the University of Maryland, so in the States. And it has really spurred a whole bunch of debate um, in the media around, was this the right thing to do? What kind of ethical issues or concerns does the availability of such technologies uh, afford? Um, what does this speak to our relationship with animals? What does it speak to going forward as far as practices such as organ donation? I realized kind of after the fact of that presentation that I was really hoping to hear more from the students, <laughs> more of your perspectives on this situation. But I also recognize that when I confront or deal with or respond to ethical situations, I want to know more about them. I want to somehow get a sense of the concrete reality of it all. 
So I scoured the internet trying to find information about this case, recognizing at this point, much of what we know about this transplant actually is coming through conventional media uh, rather than articles that are published in journals. And I found two really short videos that I'd like to first of all share with you, um, just to hopefully throw you into that situation where you can consider what kind of ethical issues does this raise? So whether you're old fashioned and you use pen and paper or you have your computer open and you're typing, as you're watching these videos, I'd like you to make notes with respect to what's going on here? What kind of feelings does this arise in you? Are there particular concerns you have um, or otherwise? Because I'm gonna ask you for your thoughts about the ethics of this situation uh, after the videos. So I'll share the first one with you. Sorry, I'm not quite as smooth as um, Dr. Soleil with respect to my screen sharing. So one moment and here we go. On 7th January, 2022, a 57-year-old man in the United States suffering from a heart disease received a transplant from a genetically modified pig. Surprised? The process is called xenotransplantation, where organs or tissues from animals are grafted or transplanted to humans. But this is not the first time that the procedure has been attempted. In the 1960s, chimpanzee kidneys were transplanted into humans, where one of them survived for over nine months. In the 1980s, a baboon's heart was transplanted into a baby who died a few days later. Most notably, in 1997, a surgeon from Assam, in collaboration with a doctor from Hong Kong, attempted a pig to human heart transplant in Guwahati, where the patient survived for seven days. Both the doctors were arrested under the Transplantation of Human Organs Act 1994 for culpable homicide and jailed for over a month. They had not applied for registration for the process. Today, he remains confined to his campus premises even two decades later. This is in the wake of many hurdles that doctors face, where sometimes even a well-matched human donor organ is rejected by the patient's body. So, it might take a long time to refine this practice. The patient from the US, Mr. Bennett, is still connected to a heart-lung bypass machine as doctors wait to give a definitive prognosis of the procedure. He is also being monitored for infections like porcine retrovirus, which might be transmitted to humans during such a procedure. Two technologies, gene editing, where the DNA is inserted, deleted or modified, and gene cloning, where a genome is copied out of all DNA extracted from an organism, have made it more likely for patients to survive such a transplant. In this case, six human genes were inserted into the pig to make its organs more tolerable to the human system. If this therapy is matured, it might bring hope to thousands of patients across the world who die of organ failure every day. Okay, so that was the first video. And the other one I'd like you to watch is this one here. Innovation and celebrating diversity during Black History Month. But first, an update on pig heart transplant recipient David Bennett. On Super Bowl Sunday, he felt well enough to watch the big game with his physical therapist, Dr. Chris Wells. He was very much engaged in seeing the games. His spirit lifted when he started hearing some of the singing going on. And he looked really like he was quite engaged and, and emotionally moved by the song that was going on. Uh, I think it was America the Beautiful. That's it. And I just spontaneously, why don't you sing it? And he started singing it, and I just thought it was extremely moving for him to sit there and look at the TV and, and sing along with the, the singer that was, that was performing that night. There you go, you got it. Mm -hmm. 
it was very emotional. It was a very special um, memory that I'll, I'll always uh, cherish. That was awesome. A board certified cardiovascular pulmonary and critical care specialist, Dr. Wells has been working with Minister Bennett for months. Not only are we working on the building blocks that allow us to move and do the things we want to do in life, like strength, balance, coordination, um, but then using those building blocks to build functional activities, like being able to roll, sit up out of bed, sitting balance, and hopefully eventually standing and getting into a chair. One of my biggest goals for him right now, the most immediate goal for him is to actually be able to get him to a point where he can sit up out of bed into a chair upright long enough that we can actually take him out of the unit. Bennett's recovery has been slow due to the severity of his illness before the transplant. He's quite courageous. Um, there's lots of people out there rooting for him that contact me all the time just saying, tell Dave that we're rooting for him. And um, it's a pleasure working with him. In our discovery. So, like I talked about in their last presentation, there's lots of different ways of looking at this situation, of beginning to ask ethical questions or reflect ethically on just what is it about this situation that would lead us to feel comfortable by saying a good thing was done compared to a bad thing was done? Um, or to also say that I'm not quite sure where I, I, where I sit morally or ethically uh, with regards to the situation. Um, I put up this list, um, if that helps you think uh, or reflect on the situation, but I'd like to hear some thoughts from different people who are in attendance. What are your thoughts about this Zeno transplantation? So, you know, it's, it, it's even more complicated than what the videos present because this patient is actually an ex-con, right? He, he stabbed somebody seven times uh, years ago and, and it was very lengthy sequelae for the person that he attacked. So, I mean, that's just one other element here. Um, but it, it's an extremely complicated setting and I don't know what the students feel about, like, did you expect to see somebody in better shape, you know, more robust, more capable? Because a part of being chronically ill um, is sort of deconditioning, right? Becoming less able to do all the usual things of life. And so this patient was in, in pretty bad shape before the uh, transplant. So um, that's, that's why he's not able to, to, to do more things at the moment. So, so Kim, thank, thank you for starting this off. So one perspective to look at the situation is from the perspective of, of this patient, of, of David Bennett. Right, and these are a few pictures. One one picture that shows this. This is a man who has a family, right? It's a man who has children and grandchildren, right? Um, a, a man who has a, a face and a story, and one can only wonder. I, it, it's hard for me to, to tell from the writing, um, but but like Kim said, he wasn't in in good health in the time leading up to this procedure. He's still not in good health and now two months recovering from the procedure. Um, although it sounds like from the most recent updates, he's been disconnected from um, some form of a, a bypass or heart-lung uh, machine. 
what does consent look like in a situation when your health is is already so compromised and you're given a, a choice of a, a medical intervention that may help that may prolong your life but also may also prolong your dying as well um isn't is consent in this situation truly free consent is supposed to be free in the sense of we respect individual patients' autonomy. Uh, we want them to not feel pressured to make a particular decision. But when your only option is an experimental therapy, when you've been denied conventional heart transplantation, is that truly a free choice? Um, how do you disclose information uh, for a procedure whereby we really don't understand the short and long-term risks. We don't, we haven't transplanted pig hearts into, or genetically modified pig hearts into hundreds of patients and can say that there's a this percent risk of, a, um, you know, acquiring infection or this percent risk of, of rejection. We're still so much learning about this procedure. What kind of risk does one need to be able to understand in this situation when we talk about capacity consent? So, so there's different kind of ethical issues from the perspective of the patient. There's also ethical issues from the perspective of, of the family, right? Issues from the perspective of the physicians. And as, as Kim mentioned, this, this individual has a history. Um, he uh, previously uh, served jail time uh, as a consequence of um, uh, attempted murder. So this is a, a, a tweet, I, I believe, from Leslie Sch Schumacher, who was the, the sister of, of the person who he stabbed. I cannot believe that the Herald Mail Media, USA Today, and the University of Maryland Hospital all wrote an article about the first fake heart transplant. The recipient is David D. Bennett Sr. That uh, so-called man that stabbed my brother seven times, paralyzing my brother. My brother lived a very hard and painful 19 years after it. My brother, Edward Schumacher Jr. suffered so many things from infections, bed sores you could fit uh, your fist into, MRSA, sepsis, and a stroke that eventually left my brother with a child's mental capacity. David Bennett got 10 years, only served five years. My brother won a $3.4 million lawsuit against Bennett and Bennett worked under the table, married someone putting everything in her name so my brother would not ever receive a penny from the lawsuit. I was told by someone a bit ago that it doesn't matter what Bennett did because it's unethical to refuse treatment to Bennett because he's simply a human. Well, if that's the case, then why do people get rejected from a transplant list and end up dying? My brother died May 6, 2007, 19 long years after the suffering he endured, and Bennett gets a second chance at life again. My brother didn't get a second chance at anything. Bennett is mentioned as a hero in the write-up story. No way is he a hero. David Bennett is an attempted murderer, turned murderer because my brother died due to the act of being stabbed by Bennett 19 years later. And that's a, a picture of, of her brother. JC, thank you for putting up your virtual hand. What are um, your thoughts? I was just wondering, could there also be ethical concerns in terms of like animal rights issues and like the process of gene editing and harvesting the organs? Like, could that be something to look for? For sure, JC. So that's that's another perspective. And we, we talked a bit about it at the end of last time. You know, usually when we talk about organ donation. Um, we talk about also obtaining consent from the donor, right? Um, but you can't actually obtain consent from, from a pig, obviously. Um, and that raises the question of, of how do we engage in, in, in treatment uh, of animals if, if ultimately they're being treated as a resource or actually in this case, a, a technology, a medical intervention. Um, and there's many different ways of looking at, at animal ethics in this situation, um, which are complicated when you're dealing with an animal that has been genetically modified, because one can raise the question, is this still fitting in the pure class of an animal? On the other hand, one can also do a case comparison perspective and say, look, if it's okay to uh, kill a pig for the purpose of having a, 
I don't know, I'm a vegetarian, a hamburger? Is that what pigs are made into? I don't even know what's in the hamburger. Um, or some other kind of uh, pork-based product. Uh, surely uh, killing the pig to save an individual's life um, is, is more ethical than using it based on consumption. But thank you, JC. That's an, another perspective to the bring to the table. Other thoughts? Ryan, Mispa, Nimna, Noor, Irina. Any thoughts, comments? That's all right, we will keep going. I'm hoping though that you can gain a sense of there are different ways of looking at the situation and it actually is quite ethically complex. Another way of looking at the ethics of a situation is not necessarily to look at it, you could say so much from a perspective, but to instead look at the technology itself. And as a way of introducing this kind of philosophizing or reflecting on the ethics of technologies. Um, I thought I would turn to some Canadian content, Marshall McLuhan. Kim, do you cover Marshall McLuhan in your class? Uh, <laughs> we haven't talked about him. No, 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 no. no. Um, so, so for those who are, um, you know, maybe a bit, a bit younger, they not, may not know Marshall McLuhan, but um, really in, in the 60s and 70s, um, he was very influential as, as far as science and technology and continues to have a, a, a legacy very much with um, media ecology. Um, and he, some phrases that are often attributed to Marshall McLuhan is um, uh, the medium is the message, right? So whereby we need to not just focus on, you know, so-called the content of media, but rather the media itself, because that discloses certain understandings or a way of understanding human um, computer, human machine, human technology interactions. One of the books that he wrote with his son, um, Eric McLuhan, uh, Laws of Media, he talked about a tetradic uh, analysis of media. And for media, you can basically think of any kind of technology. And the basic idea of this text is that technologies cannot be seen as neutral or passive, but rather have in and of themselves a logos, all right? A way of conditioning um, the world around them. Every medium or technology extends a human property or amplifies a human property, um, obsolesces a previous medium, tends to retrieve much older medium, and reverses its properties when pushed to its limits. So, you know, a conventional technology one could look at could be, you know, the automobile. What does it enhance? What does it amplify? Well, it enhances our ability to move quickly between distances, right? What does it obsolesce, make obsolete? You know, the horse and carriage, the bicycle, older technologies, right? As a new way of moving is afforded. Um, what is brought back with, um, uh, you know, automobiles? So what does it retrieve? The notion of the passenger, right? So unlike say, um, you know, a bicycle, now you have people being driven around. What is it reversed into when pushed to its limit? Well, you could say that cars reverse into traffic, right? In the sense of at some point, what was supposed to get us there faster actually now becomes um, a barrier to us even to move, right? So the notion of a traffic jam. So instead of a generic medium, we could put in the center of this genetically modified xenotransplantation, right? And I just take this definition from um, Health Canada, right? Um, which would regulate um, uh, 
such technologies. And one can ask the question, so what does this technology amplify? So we could say that this technology amplifies the availability of viable organs, right? It amplifies or enhances human longevity. We can live longer when our parts can be replaced, right? It amplifies healthcare resource use. So if you were to step back and say how many different individuals were involved in the care um, of this patient who received a uh, pig transplantation, it's massive, right? The amount of spending that has gone into keeping this, this person alive. We can also then say, what does it make obsolete? Well, in a way, if um, transplantable organs are no longer a limited resource, right? Because currently in organ transplant, we don't have enough organs to meet demand. So what it obsolesces is actually the waiting list, right? Which means we don't necessarily have to have the same kind of criteria for organ recipients because we're no longer dealing with a scarce resource, right? We no longer have to weigh why one person may be more deserving compared to another. Um, potentially it also obsolesces human organ donation. What does it retrieve? It retrieves organ as a replaceable part, right? This way of thinking of us as mechanistically rather than as a whole. It re retrieves technologies like immunosuppression, right? Uh, genetic modification, animal farming, animals as a source of human goods. And what does it reverse into if it's pushed to its actual limits? Right? So if we push this and develop this technology so far, um, what does it become? And we could say it becomes organ design, right? Animals as hosts for human organs, right? So if we modify uh, an organ to such an extent that it no longer resembles or more closely resembles a human organ compared to the animal organ that it started out to be. So pushing it to its limits, Xenotransplantation could actually be understanding as moving towards human transplantation. It can also be, uh, be pushed to the limits to open up windows of organ monetization, right? Where organs are essentially sold and any other kind of resources. So my way of introducing or my reason for introducing this kind of thinking of attending to technologies is I'm hoping that you can begin to appreciate that these kinds of ways of reflecting or looking leads us to start to question the ethics of a technology in a different way. Okay. Um, this is just a, a, some, an, an art picture inspired from Margaret Atwood's um, uh, Orcs and Creek, right? Which, um, you know, deals with some issues around, you know, genetic modification and, and organ transplantation. Any questions, any thoughts people had about where we're at so far? So although, you know, Marsha McLuhan is, you know, from the 60s and 70s, that's a long time ago, right? I know some of you weren't even born back then. I certainly wasn't. But it's still actually a, a helpful way of beginning to reflect on the technology. So, um, you know, just uh, last week, I was reading an article that had been published, which consisted of a tetradic analysis of some kind of conventional medical technology. So it's still a useful way of reflecting. So getting to our objectives for today, we're half an hour in already. These are one of the take home points I wanna uh, present. Sorry, Misma, you have a question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering where did they get the idea of ever doing pig transplants? What Did they just test a whole bunch of animals and see that they were like genetically similar enough or like why did they choose pig? Sure. So there's there's a bunch of different reasons. And what I can also do is send out uh, a nice longer video, which goes a little bit more into the history of transplantation. Um, in short, uh, pigs are a very attractive model for research. 
uh, and there's a number of both pragmatic as well as ethical considerations. So um, pigs are considered much lower on the kind of hierarchy, right, of, of, um, of animals. So people are more willing to, to subject them to experimentation, meaning that it is much more, you could say, ethically sound or reasonable to pursue experiments involving pigs than say gorillas or chimpanzees um, or other uh, mammals that are, are, are closer to us. Um, another reason is we have a great deal of experience in raising pigs, right, from, from farming, right? So they're very easy to produce in large number. So you can imagine it's, it's very attractive to um, be able to say we're, we've figured out this process of xenotransplantation with pigs as donors. Um, we can breed 100 pigs much more easily than we could breed, you know, 100 of potentially an, another mammal. And then there also are some of the pragmatic considerations with regards to size of the organ. Um, orientation of the vessels where it's situated in the pig relative to human and so forth. Um, you could say surgical considerations. But there are there are different rationales, Ms. Buck, for sure. Does okay. that help to address your question? Yeah, that answers it. Thank you. Okay. I'm by no means like a, a, a surgeon with, with expertise in, in, in why pigs compared to others, but those are certainly some of the reasonings that are described in the literature. So my first point, our technologies are constitutive of our very being in the world. What does that mean? If you look around you right now um, to this Zoom room that we find ourselves in, you can ask the question of what around us is in and of itself not a technology or some way touched by technology. We would not be here having this conversation if it weren't for technology, right? Um, none of us, I don't think, are, at, are in geographically the same place, yet we're still somehow communicating with each other in this shared virtual space, right? Um, we don't even have a sense necessarily of where we are as both Kim and I have little virtual backgrounds, mine much less creative than Kim, um, that don't portray whether we're in the hospital or whether we're in the basement at home or otherwise, right? But it's not just that our technologies afford our opportunities, they also shape how we interact with one another. It's very different to ask a question or even to feel compelled to have to answer a question when you're not in the same room. I can't look around into each one of your eyes and kind of say, anyone have any comments? Anyone have any thoughts about this? It's all that more easy to turn your camera off. So I'm just using this in, in a way to hopefully point towards that um, as humans, uh, technologies are very much a part of our lives. And I would challenge any of you to say that there is something that isn't in some way touched by technologies. Sorry, I pressed on the wrong screen. Philosophy of technology deals with these concerns by asking questions such as, what role do things play uh, in our technological culture? Should we assign agency or responsibility to technologies themselves? What effects do technologies have on us? And how do technologies constitute our humanity? There's many different ways of grouping kind of perspectives or traditions within philosophy of technology. Um, I like this grouping and, and I still refer to it even though it's, it's now a few years old. One way of looking at technologies is an instrumental perspective where we simply regard technologies as tools, right? An example of an instrumental way of thinking about, about technologies would be 
guns don't kill people, people kill people. There is nothing morally active about a gun, but rather we simply pick it up and use it or put it down. Another way of looking at technologies is what's called a singular transcendental perspective. Here we don't look at technologies, we look at technology in general. And we talk about how, you know, technology is destroying our social fabric, how we inter interact with one another. Here there isn't a nuanced understanding of how a gun is different from an iPhone, different from an automobile, different from the internet, different from social media. It's rather technologies are simply technology. Um, technology will be the death of us all or will be the savior for us all. And then the most contemporary way of looking at technologies is what's known as the empirical term. And here we don't look at technologies in isolation, but rather we say there is something inherently different about an iPhone compared to a computer, compared to some other technology with the way that it mediates or shapes social interactions. Within the empirical turn of technology, um, one finds uh, areas such as the work done by Marshall McLuhan, right, where he would say we need to look at individual media with regards to how they affect our human sensibilities. And we also find a movement called post phenomenology, which I have to say I find very helpful from, from an ethics perspective. Within post phenomenology, technologies are understood as the condition for intentionality intentionality meaning how it is that we are conscious of our world, how it is that the world appears to us as humans. Post phenomenology is geared towards understanding the multiple ways that a technology may mediate human experience, may shape the way that the world is disclosed. The privilege is given to mediation, um, over the subject or over the object. Another presupposition of post-phenomenology post is that our usual way of encountering, te encountering technologies, and honestly, this dates back to Heidegger and others, is that we tend to encounter technologies pre-reflectively. What does that mean? That means for the most part, when we're using technologies, we don't think about how we are using them. We just use them, right? So a prime example, when I drive my car to work, I don't think about the experience of driving a car. I simply drive the car, right? The only time we tend to think about technologies are when they become barriers, obstacles, or they otherwise break down. And those moments of technologies becoming apparent or presenting themselves to us offer us opportunities for reflection. But ultimately, we have to remember that the interest is not on how a technology functions when it breaks down, but rather the way in which, it, which a technology mediates our experience and our actual day-to-day -day living within the world. Does that make sense? Sorry, it's hard without seeing anyone's face. I can't see if anyone's nodding or shaking their head. There are thumbs up. I'll take that as a, as a big positive. Thanks, Jason. So Don Eide, um, with respect to uh, post-phenomenology, um, gives us four different relations. And since Don Eide, there's been others who have written about uh, technologies. And he says, we can think about technologies as essentially structuring our experiencing of the world in four different ways. One of them is an embodiment relation. So a good example here would be a hammer, right? Would be a cane, would be a gun. A technology that I embody becomes part of my body, right? And it changes the way that I interact with the world, but as it becomes part of me, um, my limbs, my 
artifices my senses in and of themselves change. Right? So the expression, when I hold a hammer, everything becomes a nail, speaks to that experience of embodying technology. Another example would be a hermeneutic relationship. Here at the technology I don't embody so much as it discloses the world, right? So the example here would be, I wake up in the morning and I look to the you know, iPad that's stuck to the wall that tells me what the temperature is gonna be like outside. The technology discloses the world to me by providing an interpretation of it. There are also those technologies that we have an alterity relationship with, that we encounter as an other, whether that's Siri or Alexa or some other technology that we start to relate to as an other, right? Siri, play me my favorite song, right? Alexa, tell me a joke. And then there are those technologies that sit within the background that we hardly ever notice whether that's the air conditioning or the lighting or, or something else that structures our environment, whereby we as humans wouldn't live the way that we do, did it not exist. So for Don Eide, the question becomes, how does this particular technology mediate my relation? And he would point to, you know, healthcare medical practice, education, any kind of institution that we find ourselves is composed of different technologies. So for me, the doctor, the stethoscope is a technology I embody. I encounter imaging technologies in their hermeneutic aspects as they present a child in a particular way. Other technologies like the isolate or incubator um, I encounter as another when they become an obstacle to me, when I can't get at holding a child because they force my hands to interact with a child in a particular way. And yet on the other hand, they can also shift or otherwise go unnoticed into the background. Right? So something like the neonatal monitor, for example. So I'm using Don Eide as an example for this first point, technologies are constitutive of our very being in the world. Any questions about that point before we move on? Just see something in the chat. Yeah, I wish our class was in person too. Okay. The techno-ethical question fundamentally considers how does a technology weave into human life, affecting our perception, decisions, and actions. And following from the previous talk, we could say technologies are fundamentally ethical when they change the way that we relate to those who are other than ourselves, right? When they change the way that we relate to our children, when they change the way that we relate to our patients, when they somehow mediate the way we relate to our loved ones then we're truly dealing with the ethical effects of technology. And we may later ask, are these morally good or are these morally bad? In the interest of time, um, I'm not gonna show a video that I sometimes show for this class, but I'll send the link out after. Um, but I'd rather point to just a couple quotes from Bernard Stiegler, um, who's a, uh, philosopher who's unfortunately uh, passed away in the last couple of years. And for him, he describes technologies are not external to our being, rather than are what makes us human, as we are realized as technical beings, forever constituted by and constituting technology. What does he mean by that? Our capacity to embody a technology, to pick up a hammer, and to now relate to the world as a nail, right? For us to somehow blend with a technology and that technology to reshape how we interact with the world reveals that we as humans are ultimately technical as our being. There is no such thing as natural, right? There is only technical. 
and as humans, we are technical in our being. This means as we create technologies, we are also recreating the sort of humans that we are or will become, right? So who are the most important shapers, consequential people in changing how our society is with time? Sorry, it's not the politicians, right? It's not the medical doctors. It's the designers of our technologies, right? The designers of the iPhone had a much larger impact on how we relate to one another, how our children relate to one another, how they now go on dates, right? Um, form social relationships, um, than any kind of policy that comes down from uh, a government authority. Comments about that. The next is technics constitute our own moral consciousness as they constitute intersubjectivity, historicity, temporality, purpose, meaning, and freedom as constitutive elements. So this is going back to um, what I already presented last week, this idea of a moral experience. Moral experiences meaning our sense of whether our values are being realized or thwarted in everyday life, right? Whether something ultimately resonates with us as being a good thing or a bad thing. What is actually constituted as good or bad is a function of our history, our intersubjective relations, our sense-making, all of which are constituted or otherwise informed by technologies. Now we have a tendency to imagine consciousness of other forms of existence from our own perspective. And one could say that we're trapped within our own subjectivity, that we cannot imagine a subjective existence other than our own or other than in comparison from our own subjective existence. Which means we may tend to pass judgment on other kinds of consciousness of the world, not um, rightly, but rather because of our own so-called biases or subjective grasp of the world. And clearly, as I alluded to last, last um, class, the media is a rich source of um, and now I mean media, not in the sense of technology in a broad sense, but rather in terms of, you know, um, you know, filmmaking, art, and, and so forth, um, offers us different understandings and ways of questioning um, what different technological developments may mean for our own humanity and how we ought to or may think about what is right and what is wrong. I think I showed this as, as an old in an old class, and I'm kind of repeating myself a bit here. Um, does anyone recognize where this picture is taken? The legislature grounds downtown, right? All right, uh, back side of the legislature. What is everyone doing? Looking downwards, holding things in their hand. Does anyone remember this summer? Looking for Pokemon Go. <laughs> there you go, Kim. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the summer of Pokemon Go, right? Where you would see new parents taking their newborn children for walks and the children crying all at the same time they're swiping with their fingers, trying to catch a Pokemon, right? You know, people going out for a walk, looking for a Pokemon, right? Again, designers, you could say have moral responsibilities, right? But you can also say that users of technologies also have responsibilities as well. And again, just with the aim of trying to get some interaction to pull it out from you tooth and nail, 
Um, what technologies do you regard as the most significant in shaping, influencing, changing, extending, or otherwise reconstructing our moral consciousness, our sense of what is right and wrong? So I would ask that of, out of you um, who are here in attendance now. What technologies that are on the cusp of today or tomorrow? Um, which ones concern you? What keeps you awake at night? What do you look forward to as ultimately reshaping society? Thoughts? Um, I don't know if it's like as concerning, but something that I think is like very fascinating is every time I go into Best Buy and every new year I go in, I notice that they have like a cool new version of the Roomba, like the cleaning robots, which are like able to at one point, like they would just be able to map out the room. And then I remember going like this past summer and now they use like some satellite technology or something to like map out like the entire floor plan and remember like where the corners of the house are and they can like map everything out and relearn things as you like move and shift like furniture around the house. So I just like find that extremely fascinating that it's like developed so much. Thanks, Mustafa. You know, I find those Roomba robots extremely interesting, right? Like just try and step back and say, all right, can we imagine the Roomba room? The, is it Roomba? Roomba, Roomba. robot? Yeah. Roomba as having a consciousness. If so, what would it entail, right? What would it see, right? Um, I wish I brought these pictures. There was this painter and an artist who tried to draw the world from the perspective of a dog, right? Where essentially the world was only what was essentially at the level of the table or below, because that's what was that's what was seen, right? Um, so what does a, a Roomba see, right? Is see even the right word, right? Or is there a different sensuality to its environment? When, like you said, it's not just interacting with the world out there, meaning whatever is picked up by its sensors, but also other kinds of input that are feeding into its algorithm, right? When a Roomba starts to so-called become a smart robot and learn from areas that it's traveled or picked up garbage in, you know, these are high traffic areas, you know, how do we understand that as, as formative of memory, right? And if you start to really go down this pathway, at what point do we have to be a little bit worried about throwing out a Roomba, right? Um, knowing that it has somehow tirelessly done a service for us. So what do we owe it? Other thoughts? So, you know, there, there, there were two really moving parts of Rich Sutton's teaching session recently. You know, I, I asked about this idea of basic human goodness. And basically he ended up thinking that's not a human trait at all, that the ability to cooperate uh, Robots, machines are a able and will be increasingly able to do that. And uh, so there is something like that, like a basic goodness, but it's not a human trait. It's, it's something that, uh, you know, you, you could think of many categories of beings, both biological and technological, having this kind of basic goodness where they can specialize and get really good at something, but cooperate with other beings then that, that uh, have different specialties, but you know, need some of the same things. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it's a really striking teaching session, I, I think, and he expressed the wish to talk about ethics. <laughs> so a, a lot of that session is about ethics. Um, and, and so it, it does kind of make you think, you know, it, is it possible that something that can be completely replaced, can be completely replicated, 
you know, you like if you have a robot, you could presumably make a thousand or a million more just like it. Um, and it doesn't really die in the way that biological things die. So does the same morality in a general sense apply to the increasingly complex behavior of, of, of such beings? <laughs> I don't know. Um, we can also think about COVID effects, you know, like um, I have three fish tanks at home and they were professionally maintained before the pandemic, not during. And yesterday for the first time I had a professional fish person come. <laughs> it was a multi-layered, experience, you know, dealing with these uh, neglect, neglected fish tanks. But my cat was fascinated by it. And uh, yeah, it just made you think. And then I was talking about the logic of certain action with fish. And the fish person asked whether keeping fish is a logical decision. <laughs> That was an interesting basic question, right? So, you know, the, the things we, we talk about here go way, way beyond just people's action. <clears throat> One interesting way of thinking is when we tend to think about technologies as becoming more developed, um, we often do use as a frame of reference human consciousness. So we say, at what point is a technology going to be able to have memories? Is what time a technology going to be able to make judgments, engage in some kind of reflection, right? Reflection, not just in that sense of you know, what happened there, but also almost dwelling in a reflective space, right? Uh, a consciousness of consciousness, if you will. But we also have to make space for, or, or wonder, you know, for future technologies or future consciousnesses, what, happened if, what happens if they are so radically different from our own, we simply don't recognize their existence as a technology in and of itself. So for example, can we regard contemporary social media, those virtual spaces where code meets conversation as expressing a technical exteriorization, formative identity formation on an individual and a collective group level, right? So can we talk about social media, Facebook, um, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever, as having a consciousness? What does that entail? What becomes a moral concern for a social media as an entity, right? Again, I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can see the value for ethics in this situation isn't necessarily coming up with a singular answer, but rather offering different perspectives. Many moral perspectives can be codified into technologies, such that designers, engineers have moral ethical responsibilities. So what do I mean by this? You know, I'm using traditional examples here just because they've written been written about um, so frequently. So this is Langdon Winner, Winner's uh, bridge, um, which was supposedly designed by Robert Moses, right? Um, and Robert Moses was an architect who designed a number of bridges in, in the United States. They were all pretty boring looking bridges, I'm sorry to say, but they're fascinating from an ethical perspective or a moral perspective. Why? Because it seems like when we look back now um, that these bridges expressed some kind of a morality a perspective of what was right uh, or what is the good thing to do, which we now regard as actually being quite wrong. So what am I getting at here? So bridges such as this one were built over the pathways that would have gone down to public spaces like beaches. 
And hopefully you can see that this is quite a low bridge. A car shouldn't have any trouble getting underneath, but public transportation would get stuck here, right? So a bus carrying people who may be from a socially disadvantaged population would not therefore be allowed to come to the beach because quite simply, unless you owned a car, um, you wouldn't be able to get there, right? So the bridge itself has a code, a morality built into it as far as what is acceptable. One way of looking at the morality of technologies is after network theory. Again, so this is another, I think, powerful heuristic for starting to ask questions or to look about technologies in a different way. So while post-phenomenology is bound up by looking at um, how technologies mediate consciousness, or McLuhan is bound up by asking how does a technology um, massage our sensibilities. After network theory looks at humans and technologies on equal grounds, right? And begins to say, how are these related to one another? What kind of rules are put into place? So mediation in after network theory um, deals with things like delegation. So what kind of tasks are delegated to technologies relative to human actors, right? Or non-human and human actors. Uh, other ideas like translation, composition, um, different technologies having a program of action. And Bruno Latour is, is clearly the person who came up with after network theory. And one of his examples was the sleeping policeman, right? And the sleeping policeman is, is basically the reference to these speed bumps, right? So they have a program of action, right? To slow cars down. Why do they slow cars down? Um, because we're trying to prevent um, you know, dogs, people, children being injured, right? By people driving too fast in areas um, where people could be running about, right? So that is their program of action. And essentially human tasks, the policeman has been delegated to the speed bump, right? Now, most of us feel comfortable about the idea of, of speed bumps unless our undercarriage takes a pretty nasty hit, right? Or you know, the streets are, are not plowed appropriately because speed bumps are in the way, because we somehow can agree morally, it's probably not a good thing to be speeding through playground zones, right? But there are other technologies that we may be uncomfortable with regards to how they were designed. And I, I used this example, um, I know in this class before. So these are different benches, right? Different public benches. And you could say they're designed for sitting. Yes, they are. That is their program of action, right? But they're also designed for sitting in a very particular way, right? You can see the subway bench in New York, the public bench in Tokyo, the wall-mounted benches in Montreal are all designed in such a way that you can't lay down on them. If you're someone who's homeless and doesn't have a place to sleep, these benches prevent that action. It's only this lovely park bench from, from Edmonton, right? You know, taken from in the River Valley that actually is welcoming of different kinds of uses of this bench. And this is a, a COVID-19 bench, right? So from downtown when they put spikes on the bench to prevent uh, people from loitering, loitering around uh, public institutions such as, such as banks, or I guess that's more of a private institution. But again, one can step back and say, what moral perspective has been codified here? Are we comfortable um, whereby we essentially start to exclude certain uh, individuals within a population from, from using them? Um, this might be all well and good for, you know, the able-bodied person who can, you know, walk 20, 30 steps or stand outside of a bank. But what about the person who gets out of breath? 
right? What about the person who relies on having a bench to sit down, um, you know, as they make their way from the car to the ATM as the consequence of, you know, lung disease or some other kind of disabling condition, right? How has this morality that we're designing essentially spoken to that those individuals within our society whose experiences we're prioritizing are essentially those who are so-called able-bodied, right? So these are questions we have to ask when it comes to technology and ethics. I don't have any specific slides on my last point, except rather to refer you back to all the other slides I have already covered. And I'm hoping that I've convinced or at least shown you that um, reflection can support how we as a society develop over time. So when we're talking about technology and the future of med medicine, ethics needs reflection on technologies themselves as much as it needs reflection on our humanity and how we interact with technologies. And really, um, it, it's an exciting time to be involved in any way with technologies, whether it's in design-based research or implementation-based research, um, because we can really change uh, in positive or negative ways um, how we as a society change over time. 10 after three, we have about 10 minutes for comments, questions, and I left my email up there because you're always welcome to email me. So, you know, there, there's no class on Thursday, the 10th, and on that day, um, Jerry Dew and um, I are, are, are going to practice setting up for a face-to-face -face class. And we're going to actually do the face-to-face -face class on virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented uh, reality a week from today in an actual room and uh, you don't have to be there, but if you are there, it will be a face-to-face -face class. Um, yeah, so, and we're, we're planning another face-to-face -face class on the 29th. Um, so, oh, wonderful. <laughs> I don't know what, what happened there, but anyway. Yeah. So um, I wonder, in, in addition to any questions about the class today, if you have any general questions, um, because we're, we're not really meeting until the 15th when we're, uh, at least some of us are meeting face to face. And on that day, you're supposed to identify your plans for the final paper and final presentation, right? So any questions about that or, or are you relatively clear about it or completely at sea or somewhere in between? Yeah. Um, I actually do have a question for that. So do you want us to come for it other than I guess with like the topic of the paper? Um, do you want us to bring anything for class or is it like kind of like the guest lectures we've had or? I guess what's kind of the format of next Tuesday? So the format of next Tuesday, um, it is, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know what that is. So the for, format is that we bring uh, VR headsets and uh, you, you wear the, the headsets as, as we do virtual reality things. There, there probably aren't enough for all eight students, but I don't think all eight of you will come. Are you hearing me? <laughs> yes? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay because I'm getting a kind of cacophony coming back, but as long as you're hearing me. Sorry, that might've been because I was unmuted. I can mute myself. 
Yeah, there's there's an echo when when you talk today, Kim, and um, your your movements are a little bit um, pixelated. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if it's if it's the internet connection where you are. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. So so anyway, um, are are there questions about uh, today's class? Any other things you want to talk about? Um, so Shauna Pandya, who is running the class next Tuesday, um, we'll, we'll be sending you more details about that. Um, we also want you to watch the video of the part one, um, quantum biology lecture because we're we're going to start with part two so we want you to already be prepared by having watched the video for that uh teaching session on the 17th so any other discussion You know, I'm I'm not opposed to letting letting you go early if that seems like the best thing to do. So anyway, uh, we'll we'll see you in a week. And thank you, Michael, very much for the teaching session today. Yeah. So. Two Professor, um, I just had a question. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering with the um, participation activities, I forgot to do the one for March, but can I still do that or is it too late? No, no, you you can still do it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're fairly relaxed about it and it's kind of an interaction between you and uh, uh Taryn who is the lead uh TA so so she's the person who will be looking at that yeah and okay. yeah no the, the, it, it, there's there's not like a sharply defined window for that I think if, if okay. you haven't done it yet and would like to do it you can certainly still do it yeah okay Awesome thing. Um, I have a question too about the same thing. I have not been doing any of them. So can I go back and do all of them? Because I really didn't know that they contribute to our participation. Sure, yes, yes, you you can do that. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of a fair dynamic because not only do you get overwhelmed with other things, but Taryn also does. So if you were saying, well, doggone it, I've done these things, has Taryn looked at everything I've done? Probably the answer is no, she hasn't looked at everything that you've done. So, you know, she's busy, you're busy. She, she will understand about the pace at which you do this stuff. It's the first time we've ever tried this. So, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's the. And um, thank you. And another question. Are we like, do we have to find a mentor? No, for the people? I, I can be your default mentor if you can't think of anything yeah. else that I, I, I can because be your mentor. And if you're a very confident person, you don't need a mentor, right? Because you know exactly yeah. what your title should be. You know how to focus your paper properly. You know how to put together an awesome talk and you're completely confident in your ability. So you don't need any advice from anybody, right? So, so if that's-, that's... I wish, I wish, I wish it was the case. I really wish it was the case. <laughs> but I was 
thinking, does the mentor have to be from the University of Alberta? Can it be someone else? Like, No, no. I mean, like, for instance, let's take David Pierce. David Pierce would love to be asked to be somebody's mentor. Sure. Yeah. So what, what we've said, it has to be somebody who's taught in the course, right? Yeah. But okay, yeah, course. no, it, 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 it can be um, anyone. Yeah. And regarding the, the like the topic, is there something like to not choose from, but do we have like a very uh, wide topic that we can maybe find a research question from or something? Because I understand it's singularity and artificial intelligence, right? Well, are we supposed? It it's the the possibilities are very broad. It, it's like all the things this course is about, or all the things that, that have been in this course, you can pick any of them. So let's take uh, okay. nanotech. There have been some years where we have taught nanotech in the course. We're not currently doing that, but you, you, you can even pick a subject that we didn't cover this year, but we have covered other years, yeah. And, and you can look okay. back look back at past um, videos. What I'll do today mm -hmm. is send all of you the uh, syllabus. There is an older mm -hmm. syllabus online, but I, I just completed the 2022 <laughs> syllabus. So yeah. I'll, I'll send you the 2022 syllabus. So, so you'll have a sort of general document about the course and what it's trying to do yeah so okay um, great today. and can we uh, get inspired by your youtube channel because i've been searching there a lot <laughs> is yeah. that okay yeah sure sure i mean the youtube channel is is a good way to figure out what you might actually enjoy you know you can quickly look at all the topics we've had in the past and see yeah. just what 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 intrigues you what interests you yeah so okay thank yeah. you thank you professor certainly yeah so any, any other questions um i had a question just quickly about the discussion posts again so we only have to do we don't have to do them all right we only have to no. do about like five to get full marks. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, what, what will happen, which, which I think is, is better for you and more satisfying, in, in many terms in the past, I gave all students the same grade for discussion because there hadn't been very much discussion and nobody really, you know, um, distinguished themselves as being a better discusser than anybody else. So I gave people the same grade, but sometimes it was a 90, sometimes it was a 95, it's dependent on my feeling about how things had gone in terms of discussion. But that's kind of a stupid way to grade. I think this is, you know, better, right? You're actually doing something practical and then that, you know, contributes to your grade. So I, I think this is a more enlightened way to, to grade class participation than, than the way I've been doing it in the past. There's, there certainly were terms where there was a huge spectrum some people came to every class with these little speeches prepared. <laughs> Other people never had anything interesting to say, right? So there's a huge spectrum in how good people were discussing things. But in the era of Zoom, that's less likely to happen. Like think, think about that, that, that like one person seeming like they're an awesome discusser and somebody else, <laughs> That's totally terrible. That's not very likely to happen. So I think these little projects with the TAs are, are a you know, better way. And I, I think fairer way to give you that, that portion of the grade. 
So, yeah. Any other questions? Comments? Okay. Well, then that's it. So we'll see you in a week. Okay. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.